Hello. The book's out. The book is out in the world. I don't even know what to say about it. <clears throat> it is uh, really, really good to be here. It was really, really good to be hanging out with you at the beginning of the uh, the book release week. Uh, this is always a weird, fraught time. Uh, you spend years and so many days and so many hours and so many frustrating moments writing something. Uh, this book in particular uh, took it out of me, beat me up something something good. Um, but I, I got to tell you, I'm very, very excited uh, to have out in the world. I've been hearing uh, from people who've been reading it who you never know with these things. You have no idea how in the world some people get a hold of them early. Uh, sometimes bookstores will release them. Sometimes the dates are a little bit fungible. I've been hearing really good things from people, which is really kind. Um, and, and and by the way, for all of you who are watching, if, if you happen to read uh, The Midnight Kingdom, let me know. Drop me a line. Um, love to hear what people think and how they experience the book. I am uh, so excited and nervous. Uh, first of all, cheers. I think that's how it um, always works anyway. Um, yeah, I, I cannot believe that this book is out in the world. Um, you are going to get really sick of me in the next week or so. Uh, Tuesday is the release day. Chances are at some point or another, you're going to come across me on a, on a podcast or a radio station. Um, probably going to be on TV, uh, maybe Tuesday. I'll let everybody know about that, but, uh, apologies beforehand. Um, the, the, the selling of books isn't like one of the things that I always sort of enjoy. Uh, it's never, ever been like my favorite thing in the world. Uh, even even though somebody has to, and there's like an entire team of people who uh, rely on me getting word out about this stuff. So forgive me for the promotion of that type of stuff, but um, y'all have made me feel very, very uh, cared after and supported and, and loved. And I just want to say thank you for that. Uh, here we are, 2023. Happy New Year's, everybody. We made it. I'm glad we're here. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that we have a, a new year to do with, uh, as we will. There is so much work to be done. Uh, personally, I have, um, <laughs> somebody said they don't, they don't see my, uh, live streams and stuff show up on Twitter. I gotta tell you, I am hearing that from a lot of people that Twitter has more or less sort of broken or, or twisted, uh, particularly when it comes to my stuff. Who knew that spending years criticizing Elon Musk and uh, gross inequality and concentrated capital was going to bite me in the ass? It's almost like all this stuff is uh, programmed to do that. Uh, but yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm spending the new year, as I've talked about in a, in a few other venues. Uh, I'm working like really, really hard to... Um, try and get some stuff together uh, to fight back against this. As I've said in previous streams, uh, I am dedicating myself to not just diagnosing the problem, but being part of the solution. Uh, I've been in touch uh, with a bunch of people. Uh, I've seen a couple names in here, people that I've talked with about, um, you know, possible partnerships, but also like coming and talking to local groups and putting together some programs uh, I just had a, a really good conversation with a group uh, earlier this week. Uh, another group I'm going to go talk to here in a few days. Uh, I'm going to be getting on the road in the next few weeks. Uh, if you want me to show up in your town to uh, read from the book, talk about the book, talk to your group or whatever, um, all you got to do, reach out to jysexton at gmail.com or reach out to the groups that you're a part of or the bookstores that you frequent. I'm happy to go around. I'm spending a lot of 2023 on the road. Uh, and on top of that, <clears throat> I'm happy to come out and work with you in whether it's your workplace or whether it's your group, starting to build these solidarity movements that are going to make the difference in the long run. I am very, very excited about it. Um, right now, the the two 
big dates that are on the calendar. Uh, February 6th, I'll be at Politics and Prose in Washington, D.C. I'm excited about that. And then uh, that is with author Melissa Scholes Young. Then on February 16th, I'm scheduled to be at Left Bank Books in St. Louis with Sarah Kinzier. Uh, very, very excited about all this. And hopefully I get to come out to your town. Uh, I'm planning on crisscrossing the country a little bit. So we have a ton to talk about. <clears throat> we got uh, we got to talk about what's happening in 2023. We got to talk about what's happening with current events, but we also have to talk about larger ideas and constructs. Uh, you know, the, these things that oftentimes sort of uh, fall to the wayside. Before we do that, thank you again. I'm so glad that y'all showed up and uh, you're happy to to you know hang out with me on a Sunday and uh, watch me drink a little bit of brown liquor and uh, talk about stuff. <sighs> All right. So let's go ahead and let's start the questions. We got a good batch tonight. We got a lot of different things we got to talk about. Question number one Wolf of the Door asked, Do you think Biden's documents will es escalate the war footing against China? Congrats on the release of the book. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Cheers. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I got to tell you, I am already sick in 15 different ways about this Biden documents controversy. Uh, I, I'm just absolutely annoyed that Biden and the people around him did such a bad job taking care of documents. There's no excuse for that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I've said this on the podcast this last week. I'm not going to carry water for Biden. I'm just not going to do it. Uh, when he does something wrong or when he messes up, I'm going to call it out. Why? Because that is the only way that we get better leadership. It's the only way that we get a better country. We're not going to sit here and turn leaders into cult objects or messiahs or saviors. This whole thing sucks. Uh, you, you have to take better care of documents. You have to take better care of secrets. Uh, absolutely blows. Sucks. Um, that being said, it is not being handled well by our media. I know. I'm as surprised as you. I expected that they were going to handle this with so much nuance and so much care. Um, of course, they they haven't. They immediately, um, you know, just equivocated this with what Donald Trump did. Um, they 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 have immediately gone ahead and said it's the exact same thing as Donald Trump stealing documents, uh, hoarding them doing God knows what. We still aren't exactly sure what he was doing with all of these state secrets uh, and, 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 and just basically stonewalling all of this. Um, it's terrible. And, and we knew that it was going to be terrible. Like anybody who's paid any attention over the past couple of years know, knew that this was going to be awful. I saw Carolyn. Yeah, I do. I do narrate the audiobook. I enjoyed it. Loved it. Um, but so this story sucks. It, it absolutely sucks. Uh, but one of the things, and I talked about this um, on uh, the podcast, it was so obvious where this was going to go immediately. Fox News got their marching orders. Right-wing uh, provocateurs and personalities jumped on it immediately. And the secret to all of this, much like the Hillary Clinton email scandal, is that it creates a MacGuffin. Right. And, and for those who aren't familiar in films, a MacGuffin is a thing, right? You can you can uh, project whatever you want on it. It can be whatever your imagination makes it. Right. And when that happens, it allows the right wing ecosystem to project whatever it wants on it. Right. So it's 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 actually kind of funny because this is actually a real scandal. Like this is actually a, an actual problem. Right. This is, you know, it, it is something that um, uh, Biden should apologize for. It is something that that needs looked into. Right. It's not enough that that's what that is. It has to become something larger. Right. So then the question becomes among the right wing. Why did he have those documents? Right. What what was he doing with them? And immediately what, what is going to happen with that is we are going to see that turned into the larger story, which is the idea that the Democratic Party is betraying the United States of America and that they're doing that with China, which is always the conservative move. It's to go ahead and blame whatever is happening internally on some sort of an external influence. Uh, I've talked about this in the past, but that is the general uh, fascistic nationalistic conspiracy theory. The country is special. It's been chosen by God, the universe, history, whatever. 
It's being attacked by people on the outside. Who are they working with? People on the inside. Fifth columns, traders, you name it. And it's always going to be liberals, people of color, all, all of that. So it's going to push really, really hard on the idea that these documents were stolen in order to traffic them to China. And as the Cold War and the Cold War type competition like heats up with China, which inevitably it will, that's the way these things work, that is going to become the drumbeat. And that is going to become the alternative reality, the alternative storyline that the Republican Party is going to hold out on. It's not enough to criticize uh, Joe Biden or any Democrat on what they've done or what they haven't done. They have to create a larger traitor narrative, which is what's happening. So, yeah, this is going to turn into treason, handing documents over to China and, and, and basically a total betrayal of the United States of America. That is exactly what we're going to see as this story progresses forward. And what it does is it goes ahead and legitimizes whatever they want it to be, right? And and in that way, if they're traitors, you know, doesn't matter if, you know, they get elected. It doesn't matter if you need to carry out violence against them. It legitimizes those right-wing authoritarian tactics. So yeah, absolutely. It's, it's going to continue to push that new Cold War narrative. Now, on that note, I want to point out that that cold, new Cold War narrative is not just the domain of the Republican Party. This is one of the defining narratives that is taking hold within the body politic of the United States. Um, it, it's, it's understood in both conservative and liberal circles that you're supposed to look at China and you're supposed to see it as not just a rival, but a, a massive, massive threat. And as that takes place, we're going to see more and more spending on things like uh, national security. We're going to see more money spent on the defense budget. We're going to see these massive investments when it comes to things like the manufacturing of, of chips, but also pretty much everything else. As, I, as I, I've talked about for years on here, and, and uh, unfortunately, we, we've seen how this has happened. Globalism is starting to roll back. Industrialization uh, is, is going to come back to America, a reindustrialized America, uh, which can be done in really good ways. Like it can actually go ahead and, and help parts of America that have been completely forgotten, people who have been completely forgotten, or it can go ahead and jumpstart the, the authoritarian project that the Republican Party is, is pushing. And, you know, some very, very specific people within that party. But yeah, this documents thing is going to feed into that. Um, you know, I think the Republican Party is probably going to put a lot of their energy, a lot of their time and a lot of their money into uh, portraying Joe Biden as a traitor and some sort of communist agent, whether willing or unwilling. Yeah, I think that's uh, going to happen. Stephanie says reindustrializing the green technology. Let's go. I completely agree, which is what should happen. That's what the Democratic Party should put their weight behind. And by the way, I, I, I think that there is a completely open lane for them to do that. Uh, they're, they're terrified of it. They're so absolutely terrified of saying Green New Deal. They're so afraid of pushing any sort of technology that will start, you know, leading to like a casting of stones with the Green New Deal because the Republican Party and their strategists have made it absolutely toxic. And as a result, they, they don't want to fight back. They don't want to fight for it. But the answer is to go ahead and reindustrialize, pay people living wages, make sure that they're protected by regulations and that they're, you know, they're allowed to unionize and, and, and engage in their own solidarity. And by the way, you're exactly right. Oil and gas are the huge money makers for corporations. They have a stranglehold over what is, uh, over what happens in our politics. And as a result, <sighs> We, we find ourselves here, like absolutely butting our heads against anti-innovation because, you know, there there is captured concentrated capital. But yeah, that's what the Democratic Party should do. Go, go full bore. I say this all the time. The people. Oh, I've got an answer for that, S. Urbana. I'm glad you asked that. So real fast, I always say this. Uh, my people factory workers, laborers uh, who don't believe in climate change, you know, they, they say it's a bunch of shit. Those people will believe in it if they have jobs in it. You just have to push that thing forward. 
And if you push that thing forward and you end up employing people and have them gainfully employed, good jobs, and you get them protected, that's a game changer. But part of the problem is that they're not willing or they don't want to fight for that. They don't want to put, you know, their lives, reputations, and seats on the line. This is why I always say <clears throat> that when people all the time are like, well, this is conventional uh, political knowledge, what they forget is that the game can change, that the electoral map can change. And these are game changing things. <clears throat> Esther Banna says, why do they think, they'll, who do they think they will get to work in these factories if they bring back industrialization? Well, there are a lot of people who will work in these factories. But I want to point something out. There is absolutely a line between reindustrialization and taking away a woman's right to choose. They're trying to create a, a working underclass. That's, that's a big chunk of all of this. And part of the reason why they're rolling back all of these regulations and, and the, the, the protections of the 20th century, they really, really want that. And they want to go ahead and create a situation where they don't have to pay people anything. Right. It's cents on the dollar. And you can do that if you can convince people that they're doing it for God or if they're doing it for, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, higher purpose or some sort of world conflict, which is how fascism and Nazism work. They convince you that you're part of a crusade and that's why you should go to work and, you know, take less dollar or less cents on the dollar. By the way, somebody asked me. Um, what I thought about the M&Ms and Prince Harry. First of all, Mars is such an exploitative corporation. And I always enjoy that, you know, it, they're being portrayed as like this woke corporation when they are just exploiting people around the world. Um, this whole sort of thing that they're doing with all female M&Ms is like such a PR stunt. It's unbelievable. But also, what does it do, Right. It creates the type of culture war showdown that is absolutely great for business. People are going to go out and buy M&Ms, which, I, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. I hope we can be all right with this. We've built up some trust, I can say this. Plain M&Ms aren't my favorite. Peanut M&Ms, pretty good. Peanut butter M&Ms, pretty good. Plain M&Ms, not so great. Overrated candy. Sorry. But it's going to make people who haven't eaten M&Ms in forever go out and buy M&Ms in order to show that they support these types of things, that their political ideology is on the line. And what happens there? There is a perfect opportunity for things like Fox News and for other, uh, you know, confectioners or candy makers to go ahead and do that, right? To go ahead and provide an alternative. Uh, we live in a consumer political society. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I, I think Prince Harry is engaged in that as well. There is a reason why he's unhappy and, and, and why Meghan Markle is unhappy. They were mistreated. And by the way, the, the royal family should go away. But it is also a consumerist moment. They're cashing in for everything that there is there. And by the way, it is, you know, leading to incredible profits and ratings and all of that good stuff and traffic. So it's, it's consumerist politics, unfortunately. P.K. Wilde says, I've done a cursory study of when the Jews fled Nazi Germany. The first stage was 1933 to 1937, when the government passed decrees limiting the place of Jews in society and also periods of street violence. We see this happening in the United States to trans people. Your thoughts on targeted folks fleeing? <sighs> First of all, you're exactly right. This is one of those situations. Um, gay and trans people uh, are probably going to bear the, the largest initial brunt of the authoritarian movement. Um, you know, they already have. They've already been attacked. They've already been vilified. Uh, they've already, in some circles, been turned into uh, targeted populations. We're seeing um, bizarre paramilitary maneuvers going after them and attacking them. It's really awful. I want to point out that, you know, a lot of people who, who, 
lot of people who talk about politics, I'm talking about pundits, I'm talking about, um, you know, op-ed writers, I'm talking about a lot of these people who are supposed to be serious people. Uh, a lot of them consider themselves liberals or never Trumpers or whatever. The people who continually advocate that we need to somehow or another, we need to get the left under control and wokeism needs to go away. And maybe if we just, you know, stop talking about gender, or we stop talking about gay people, or we start, you know, stop talking about white supremacy, maybe this thing will stop. And we've seen that throughout history. One of the things that um, I was most shocked about writing the Midnight Kingdom was how liberal liberal individuals or people who consider themselves liberal individuals are continually finding themselves throughout history supporting these authoritarian movements um you know in ways that they didn't even necessarily think that they possibly could uh, i say this all the time i am having so many conversations with people who are talking themselves into Ron DeSantis because he's not Donald Trump. And I'm talking about people, you know, who, who are dyed in the wool liberals or supposedly are. What you need to understand is if you throw these people overboard, uh, somebody said Malcolm X had a thing or two to say about these, uh, about these folks. So did Martin Luther King, you know, let's go ahead and put that out there on, uh, this weekend. If you start giving up these populations, I have to tell you, there's no end to the suffering that's going to take place. I'm talking about people being made unsafe. I'm talking about people being assaulted. I'm talking about people being harassed. I'm talking about people being, uh, you know, possibly wiped out. The aggressiveness by which the, the Republicans and the right wing are going after these people already should tell you what is possible if they continue to gain power and purchase. I want to say to uh, PK, I, I, I want this to be a country where people don't have to flee. I also worry that if we don't win this thing, and if we do not defeat authoritarianism, there won't be anywhere for these people to go. The major so-called democracies of uh, so-called Western civilization, uh, they're all being engulfed by right-wing authoritarianism. A large part of it has to do with a generational discomfort and homophobia and, and, and transphobia that uh, I got to tell you is, is primed through uh, gendered uh, pressures, um, to conform, uh, gendered abuse, gem gender trauma. Um, honestly, gender is one of the bedrocks of, of the status quo. Uh, it, one of the reasons why people lose their mind when it comes to, uh, LGBTQ issues is because gender is fundamental in, in holding up these, um, these hierarchies. And, and this suffering and exploitation. It's about, it's about roles. It's about performances. And um, there, there's a reason why this issue is being used by the right. It's because it makes some people uncomfortable. Uh, some, some people don't understand it. There are the generational and, like I said, um, passed down traumas and, and abuses that, that make sure that people, you know, react so badly to all of this. It's... It is unacceptable to me to have a society where people have to flee, uh, that, that gay and trans people won't be safe or won't have a place within it. Um, that's, that's my stance. Unacceptable. There's no bargaining there. There's no giving in to this right-wing authoritarian movement. I'll be damned if I do that. And you, you shouldn't either. There is no safety in bargaining these people away. And I got to tell you, the, the violence that will be visited upon them, you may not see it, but I have to tell you, eventually it's going to be visited upon you. Right-wing authoritarianism doesn't just stop, right? You don't just hand Hitler over some territory and he's like, that's fine, I'll, I'll go hang out and, you know, be groovy. That doesn't happen. This thing will only grow. And sitting there believing that the woke left 
which by the way is not left. It's just saying people should be able to live without having to live in fear. It's not leftist. It's the most centrist thing imaginable. The idea that people should be able to live, um, live in safety and, and not have to fear for their lives. That's not leftist. But this idea that you are somehow or another going to stave off right-wing authoritarianism by giving them what they want. If you truly believe that, best of luck. So that's my answer to that question. Um, I don't want to live in a society where those people have to flee. Olivia, you're elected, you're elected president. What do you do? I love how people keep asking me, what would I do if I was president? I think that stems from a couple of things. I think uh, largely uh, frustration with someone like Joe Biden. Um, but I always say, first of all, if I'm elected president, you've got some big problems. Uh, I shouldn't be president. But I do have some ideas on what a president can and should do. Uh, I think the last totally effective transformational president um, in, in, in regards to what we need right now is someone like a Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We have to take a look at using the bully pulpit. You have to go out there and constantly say, because I got to tell you right now, the way that this system is set up, it is set up to attack anyone who wants to change things. It is not set up to be conducive to changing things in the way that they need to be changed. The only thing you can do is by running a campaign to get elected in the first place that is a populist, uh, massive, massive populist campaign. Uh, you have to start crossing. Um, party lines based on class and uh, bottom to top uh, inequality. And then when people stand in your way or when these institutions get in your way, you need to, you know, get out on the bully pulpit. You need to point out who's doing it, even if it's in your own party. The fact that Joe Biden never criticized Joe Manchin or Kirsten Sinema in public was a problem. He basically handed over the keys to the country to Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema. You have to call them out. You have to put forth an agenda. And this is actually one of the larger problems that has taken place with this presidency. There is no larger story. The idea was that he was going to restore normality. Well, normal sucks and it wasn't good in the first place. And everybody knows that and feels it. Whether you're left, you're center, you're right, you're a Democrat, you're a Republican, you're an independent, we all know that this thing isn't working. You can't just go out and say, ah, don't worry, everything will be fine. Just, just hang out, it'll be fine. It doesn't work. You have to give them a roadmap. You have to say, this is where we're going. So yeah, if I was president, like it would be nonstop bully pulpit class warfare. <laughs> That's it. I mean, that's that's the only way that you can you can take this thing on. And you have to hope that there will be some sort of a populist movement to back you up. And in the case that, you know, people get in your way and, the, and in the case that you can't get these things, uh, you know, uh, uh, pushed forward, you have to have a lot of people out there in the streets who are ready to shut shit down, who are ready not to go to work, who are ready to go on strike. And I, that's, that's the only way that you do it. So yeah, it would, it would, it would be, um, I'll just say it would be interesting. It'd be tumultuous. It'd be interesting. Terry says your new year's podcast on Substack hit home for me as a person who has complex trauma and also thought I'd find some happiness through career advancement. I think you're right that mental health is a huge component of what's happening. What can be done? Um, so I've said before, I said this in a conversation with Mary Trump a while back, um, I think she agreed with it as well, that this isn't just a political and economic and societal crisis. Um, it's also a mental health crisis. Part of the problem is that we have a system set up that doesn't work. And on top of that, it traumatizes us in terrible ways. Uh, I'm scheduled, by the way, to talk to uh, Dr. Sandra Bloom for the podcast tomorrow. I hope I hope that interview goes through. Uh, she's an expert that uh, I talked to recently, and I'm, I'm looking to talk to more in terms of how these systems work and how they traumatize people and how that trauma continues to cycle through populations. This is a system that is structured 
to leave us feeling terrified, but also bad about ourselves. Um, I talked about this on the 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 Substack, uh, sub Substack. That's hard to say. I talked about that on the Substack podcast. Um, you know, we we are left believing that there's something wrong with us. There's something ugly about us. There's something wrong that 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 there's nothing that we can do outside of uh, buying more things or uh, gaining more money. I mean, that's what capitalism does is it tells us that we are self-interested, self-motivated individuals. We shouldn't trust anybody else. And we should just continually screw people over in order to gain wealth and power because other people are going to screw us over. Neoliberalism is that idea on steroids. And it has left us just absolutely ravaged through with self-doubt, plus also trauma of our own and generational trauma. It's bad. It's absolutely bad. Um, as I talked about on that podcast, I think that what we have to do first is that we have to make sure that we feel like better in, in our own minds and in our own selves. We have to heal ourselves from these abuses that have been heaped upon us and the trauma that we've gone through in order to even understand who we are and what we're capable of doing and also be able to trust people and engage in intimacy and solidarity. Um, I think once we start doing that, when we start working on the, the those relationships and once we start working on that trust and having faith in one another and the faith in, in, in a movement, then all of a sudden you can start to fight back against this thing. This is honest to God, the weakness of neoliberalism. It's all brittle. It's all bullshit. It's all based on self-hating populations that are so traumatized that they're like, oh my God, just, just leave me alone with my streaming service, please. And it's it's really awful. It's awful what it's done to us. But I, I, I think we can do better. And I think what we have seen in the past few years, like a, a Donald Trump is a perfect example of this, just an absolutely ravenous black hole. It doesn't matter how much money he has. It doesn't matter how much fame he has, how much uh, uh, gratuitous wealth and, and consumption he engages in. He's miserable. All of these people are so unhappy. And what do they do? They, they rise up the ranks and then they project their own unhappiness on the rest of us and they abuse the rest of us. I think watching someone as unwell as Donald Trump for, for those years, like I think it has shown what, what is the worst case scenario. It's made a lot of us like, you know, uh, uh, run away in revulsion. And by the way, Erica says most don't have access to mental health resources. That's exactly right. One of the things that we have to fight for is mental health awareness, plus also an investment in decent mental health. And by the way, that isn't just about, and, and, and when you talk about that, it sounds like ooey gooey sort of, you know, feelings. No, it, it, it literally makes the society function. You don't reach the point of a society starting to decay like the one that we do. And also uh, where, where you can't hardly go anywhere in this country without worrying that you're going to get assaulted or die in a mass shooting. You have to push the resources into that that have been sucked out by austerity and by neoliberalism. Which we'll talk a little bit in a minute about what the possibilities are. But yeah, you have to invest in those things. We should have an understanding of mental health within our educational system. You, you should have an understanding of like how you could feel versus how you feel. But the problem in all of this is that it has intentionally been kept from us. It has intentionally been done to us. But yeah, I, I, I think it's a mental health crisis as much as anything. One of the things that I'm working on the most is that. Oh, Joe, I'm going to answer that in just a second. So um, with that, 
I, I'm working really, really hard to not just educate myself about trauma, but what what the possibilities are. There are so many people on the ground who are doing that hard work. And I think that there are plenty of possibilities there. And I think that's how you build community and that's how you build solidarity. Joe says, by the way, that a lot of conservatives blame SRIs for being the cause of violence. Of course they do. That's their only way around talking about gun laws and, and radicalization. But do I think they'll ban it? I I I think the pharmaceutical companies and the insurance companies, they're way too powerful for those things to actually get banned. Um, you know, is, are they going to make them more expensive? Probably. You know, they, they, they make a ton of money uh, from those. So it, it, it is it's it's sort of a fake platform for them. It, it allows them to sort of uh, shift around the ideas a little bit. I think a lot of this, by the way what the right wing is going to do is it's basically going to create a more stratified society. You know, whenever they're talking about things like banning pornography or whatever, or banning abortion, they're not talking about actually banning pornography. They're not talking about actually banning abortion or banning pharmaceuticals. They're talking about making sure that poor people and people of color and, and the underclass don't have those things. They have them. Oh my God. It's the same thing as, uh, you know, getting people vaccinated or not getting people vaccinated for COVID. They really did not care, you know, if millions of people died. There's a stratified society, and that's at the heart of conservatism. It's that hierarchical society. Paul, will the future of the Republican Party be comprised of brazen frauds like George Santos? They are completely empty vessels like him. All they have to offer now in lieu of any actual policy ideas. How do you think this particular case plays out? Utter disgrace or a presidential ticket? By the way, I got to tell you, this George Santos thing, I didn't want to talk about it uh, when the, when it first happened. Um, you know, Nick and I on the the muckrake, we had talked about the possibility of of doing that, and then um, <laughs> then I was like, I don't know. This whole thing seems pretty dumb. It's just a congressman. He sucks. You know, I think it's more of a reporting problem, more of a uh, Democratic oppositional research problem. I think George Santos is a really, really good example of what the Republican Party has become. I mean, you want to talk about the idea of like screwing people like you actually take a look at like he has screwed everybody that he has ever met. <laughs> he is just I mean, I saw the thing today and and listen, I, I just saw it very, very quickly. Something about him stealing somebody's scarf. <laughs> and I don't know if that's true, but I got to tell you, it sounds true. It feels true. <laughs> so bad. But yes, I, I I agree with Paul. This is what the Republican Party is becoming. Because in order to put that R next to your name, you have to understand that you are part of this larger, disgusting movement. And you have to see it for what it is, which is both a grift and a power grab. And those two elements that come together, like that attracts the worst imaginable people. And if you want to talk about trauma, like severely traumatized, unwell people, I, I mean, it's, yeah, th that is the future of the Republican Party. It's going to be more and more people who, they, they, they literally, that's all they know is hurting other people. And, and, and that is, that is going to become the norm of the Republican Party. I mean, I, I hear God, probably once a month I'll hear from uh, some Republican official or person who worked within the Republican Party. He's like, I can't do it anymore. I'm done. I can't put an R next to my name. But this is absolutely who they are and, and, and exactly what that party is attracting at this point. Deirdre says, what if they asked uh, Kevin McCarthy over the debt ceiling and don't replace for weeks? The hell of a question. I don't know. They, they held up McCarthy, who just handed over the keys to the kingdom to these assholes. And it just absolutely got him over a barrel, gave them all the power, all of the sway. Um, I don't know what's going to happen with the debt ceiling. I could absolutely see them holding this thing up and driving this country to the edge of oblivion. I, I, I could totally see that. Um, I, I would not be shocked if here in a few months that's the discussion that we're having on a Sunday night. I, I could absolutely see that. And if we get to that point, these people are accelerationists. 
That's what they're there for. They are there to push an, a, a very, very specific brand of right wing authoritarianism. And it is a it is accelerationist in nature. And part of what they want, and I was talking about this on a on an interview, it'll probably come out probably Tuesday. Like I said, you're going to be so sick of my voice in the next week. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the authoritarianism grows in crisis. And we we're already at a certain point of crisis, uh, which allows these authoritarian energies to start gaining uh, purchase. But you have to make it worse in order for some of the worst ideas to 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 come through. A absolutely bottomed out economy is a perfect environment for an authoritarian to rise to power. So no, and 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 on top of that, it's a wonderful ideal environment to push the type of oppression and regressive ideas that these people want. And by the way, that they're paid to push. So no, they're they're in there basically to uh, demolish the building from the inside. So I I would not be shocked. I would not be shocked. Jordan asked um, in, in the chat earlier, uh, the House GOP, are they going to give us nothing or is it going to be austerity? Um, I, I Probably both. I mean, really, to be honest, uh, Biden's administration is already showing an absolute willingness to uh, work in a bipartisan manner with uh, McConnell's Republicans uh, in order to get some uh, wins on the board, uh, basically is going to, um, hand over everything to get a couple of victories. So you're probably going to see some austerity. You're probably going to see some, uh, you know, some moving around of money. You're going to see some, uh, right wing conservative ideas starting to, to get passed through the government, but also it's just going to be a lot of bullshit. I mean, right now I have to tell you this gas stove debacle, it's it's a another perfect example. They're going to be talking about gas stoves for months. God knows what the next thing's going to be. I mean, is it Play-Doh? I mean, you know, they like to go that kids route. Um, whew. But yeah, we're going to get a whole lot of nothing and probably uh, austerity to boot. Teresa says, how much power will the Sedition Caucus hold in the house and what do you expect they will use it for? Again, I think that they're going to have a ton of of influence over the Republican Party. Um, one of the more disturbing trends within the GOP is that they never move. Oh, they never move back from extremism. They just don't. Uh, the Tea Party is a really good example of this, and they're they're just going to embrace more of it. And we're already seeing it happen with Fox News. Um, you know, for, for a week there during this, uh, Kevin McCarthy debacle, uh, you know, they were, they were going after the, the freedom caucus left and right. Well, guess what? In the midst of that, who was in the direct center between the Kevin McCarthy Republicans and the freedom caucus? Marjorie Taylor Greene. Marjorie Taylor Greene is a mainstream Republican now. Jewish space lasers. I don't know what else to say. I really, truly don't even know what to say after that. They are going to continue this Freedom Caucus. It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they're doing. And by the way, when the Senate gets going and your J.D. Vance and your Josh Halley are pushing this national conservatism, I mean, they're just going to embrace it. So they're going to have an incredible amount of pull particularly going into 24. As that happens, you're going to see this new weird amalgamation that's going to, um, to, to, to emerge, which is what I've been warning about now for the last two years is where this thing is going. It's been very obvious from the very beginning. Riley Rooster. How about that? Riley Rooster. I always, I always wish I had a cooler, like, you know, nom de plume name on these things like like the right wing guys they were always like they would they would have like an avatar of them in a mask or like of them as like some sort of you know fixture of popular culture here i am running around with my name this face i was born with i don't know riley rooster hello not sure how you accept questions for the bourbon talk well congratulations riley rooster you made it 
Are you familiar with Sarah Kinzier's research on Merrick Garland? Is he letting the clock run out? Looking forward to this evening. Well, thank you for the question. And yes, I'm very familiar with uh, Sarah's work uh, regarding Merrick Garland. Um, I don't trust him any farther than I can throw. Never have, never will. Um, he is so locked into our institutions, which, by the way, you 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 can't become Attorney General of the United States particularly in this moment, without being locked into the institutions. That's what it's about. The people who reach that level of power have shown themselves to be trustworthy within the halls of power. And again, as I always say, they don't want to prosecute ex-presidents. They have no desire to do that. You start enforcing laws with ex-presidents, my God, it's never going to end. So no, they never wanted to prosecute Donald Trump. They still don't want to prosecute Donald Trump. What I said in the last week was that the happiest person in the world about this Biden document controversy was Mary Garland. Wipe him clean. A negative times a negative is a positive. No, he has no interest in, in going after Trump. All of this has been the system, again, sending signals like go away or else you're screwed right? We don't want you around. You had your four years. You had your fun. You don't get to run for president anymore. If he would just go away, like they'd probably chill out a little bit in terms of investigating him. But no, I don't trust Garland at all. Um, he has way too many troubling connections. Uh, he has shown just left and right an ability to uh, not do the right thing and protect powerful people. Um, on top of that, as I talk about a lot, like the, 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 the articles and the signals that, that he sends to the press, it's really gross. So gross. And, and, and it's so obvious what this is about. It's about continuing to tell people, and I have to tell you, there's a lot of money in selling people false hope. There's a lot of money in going around being like, don't worry, guys, Merrick Garland on the case. Robert Mueller on the case. James Comey on the case. There's a lot of money in that. But we have to stop expecting these saviors. We have to stop expecting that we're just one move away from this thing being fine. We can't, you know, there's nothing we can do about it except for, you know, cheer on the right people and possibly send money to campaigns. Oh, and vote every two years. No, the only way out of this thing is doing the hard work. And if we do the hard work, then we'll get there. But Merrick Garland, no, I don't, I don't trust him at all. We, we save each other and we save ourselves. That's the way I feel about it. Honey, please comment on the Illinois sheriffs ignoring the new gun laws. I'm very concerned by this development. You and me both, Honey. Um, we're going to talk about this a little bit more on the podcast that's going to come out probably on Tuesday. For those who don't know, uh, Illinois outlawed semi-automatic weapons. Um, I want to say they were the fifth state to do that, fifth or sixth state. Uh, roughly 74 sheriffs have said that they're not going to enforce the law. Uh, there is a really, really, really troubling uh, thing happening in the world of sheriffs. Uh, we'll talk about this on the podcast, but um, a lot of these authoritarian institutes that take money from uh, the wealthy billionaires and benefactors who bankroll everything from January 6th to Trumpism and you name it, uh, they are pushing like this new radicalization of sheriffs. They see a lot of a lot of traction in terms of radicalized sheriffs uh, deciding not to enforce certain laws and to enforce other laws. Um, this is, I gotta tell you, it is one of the more disturbing trends that nobody talks about. But yeah, when this story hit the hit the wire, I was not surprised. Um, and this is what's going to happen more and more as the federal government and federal power is undercut which was the reason in the first place that they're undercutting it. They wanted to get it out of the way. Lisa says Southern Illinois is an entirely different world. I, I, I went to Southern Illinois for graduate school. I second that. I second that. That's a different world. That's what that is. But no, it's as the federal government gets undercut by these wealthy people, 
you're going to see more and more of like these like municipalities and these sheriffs and just like people basically refusing to follow the law and saying, make us do it. And what's the government going to do? Are they going to show down? You know, uh, and you know, it's like um, JFK with Wallace, you know, threatening to send in the troops. Like this is what happens. You have these showdowns in terms of power. And right now the federal government has no appetite whatsoever to get involved here. And the states, some of them don't have any appetite either. And, and these groups, these right-wing authoritarian groups who, again, are funded by the same people who funded January 6th, who probably funded the uh, coup attempt in Brazil, the Ottawa truckers convoy, and so much of this shit. Um, they see these sheriffs as an incredible opportunity to go ahead and strike back against federal authority. But we'll talk more about that. I receive... Did you read Danny Bester's op-ed about history and academia? I know you probably did as an ex-academic, but did you have any thoughts? I did indeed. Uh, this was a really good op-ed. Um, it made its way in the academic circles. I don't know how much other people saw it. Uh, Danny is a, a, an academic and a student of history. By the way, friend of the pod, has been on the Muckrake podcast. Really good guy. Very, very smart. Uh the two of us don't always agree on things, but that's a, a different conversation for a different day. I respect him very, very much. And I, I thought it was a great op-ed. And what he talked about was the fact that um, academia is being destroyed. Some of you might know I left academia um, this last year. I left it for a variety of reasons, but part of it was the fact that I was watching the academy get destroyed from the inside. I watched uh, friends of mine suffer. I saw one friend die. Um, his body just gave out. It's really ugly what is happening in higher education. Uh, the, the difference between the perception of what happens in higher ed and what actually happens in higher ed is um, massive, absolutely massive. Uh, but this is intentional, you know, um, the, um, the academy is being starved of, of resources intentionally. Uh, it's being done for a variety of reasons. One is that it has been corporatized. Uh, all of the money now goes to administrators and also creating these like uh, creating the illusion of growth and progress, right? Putting up new buildings constantly, bigger sports stadiums, more impressive uh, student sort of housing, all that stuff. Uh, meanwhile, educators are getting paid less and less. Um, tenure is being virtually eradicated, uh, because it's, it's takes away labor leverage. Uh, they want people to be terrified that they're going to lose their jobs. And so as a result that they're not going to fight back, they're just going to step in line with neoliberal administrators and, and go forward. Um, it also, by the way, has an additional bonus in all of it, which is, that it goes ahead and makes sure that the corporatization of higher, educa higher education continues and people aren't going to be taught to think for themselves. The war on education that has taken place, particularly in the wake of the 1960s, 1970s, the failed revolution of that era, is incredible. And for those who don't know, higher ed before the uprisings of the 60s and the 70s uh, was basically a, a, a laboratory for weapons manufacturers, uh, the United States Army, uh, the FBI, and the CIA. That's what they want to go back to. They want to go back to these basically being just sort of like factories that churn people out who are never going to question what's going on. And by the way, the academy is not leftist. I can tell you that is somebody who is in the academy. You don't go and... and <laughs> You're going to go for four years. You're probably not going to hear the name Marx once unless you have like a secret Marxist professor and they are very few and far between. They don't teach Marx in economics classes. I mean, it is it is straight capitalist indoctrination. Um, but no, it's the, the problem that everyone has is that students are changing the way that they look at things and they want to go ahead and reinforce discipline and, uh, you know, dogmatic control. No, I, Danny Bessner's article is fantastic. You should read it. And he's absolutely right. If you get rid of the studying of history, you don't learn from the past, you don't understand the present, you can't control the future. 
It's one of the reasons I wrote Amer uh, American Rule. It's one of the reasons I wrote American Rule, but it's also one of the reasons I wrote The Midnight Kingdom. You know, you got to understand the past and and all these stories and all this history. It makes things very clear how this happened and what we need to do. But um, yeah, they, they are attacking it like nobody's business. And Nude asks, just how fucked are we? I don't think we're fucked. I think we could be fucked. I think that it could get very, very bad. I think it could get very bad. But I don't, no, I don't think we're fucked. I say this all the time. I remain optimistic. Doesn't mean that there's not going to be uh, a lot of problems. Doesn't mean that there's not going to be a lot of clashes. It doesn't mean that there isn't going to be a lot of tragedy. But I remain hopeful and optimistic. I do. I, I I think right now, I think right now, things are getting worse before they get better. And I think part of making this world better is understanding that this is not the best of all worlds. If you haven't read it yet, by the way, I did a thing on Substack. Um, I broke down a David Brooks column in which he basically told everybody, uh, the world is better. And, you know, you what what what's wrong is you, your perception of the world. And you read it, and, like, if you actually read it, you're like, oh, my God, this is a terrible argument. Like, he, he doesn't prove anything, and anybody can see absolutely through it. And that's actually what gives me hope, in part, is that we all understand that things are not going well, and things have to get better. So, no, I, I don't think we're fucked. Now, I'm sorry that people feel pessimistic. I understand it. Um, I get it. There are there are a lot of reasons to be pessimistic, including the fact that all of the, the all the financial incentives right now are on destroying this thing and making our lives worse. But I have to tell you, I um, I think we're going to win this thing, and I think we're going to look we're going to look up, and I think it's it's going to be better. And by the way, the next question goes along with that. Peter says, "Okay, I share your optimism, but what's America look like in ten years if we win this twenty? Great question. And I'll tell you this. If we if we actually turn this ship around in 10 years, we're not having arguments about gas stoves. We're not, you know, talking about CRT and groomers and all this made up stuff because we're not having a culture war anymore. We can still have discussions about, you know, where things are going or how things could be better or, or what do we hold on to and what do we, you know, uh, what, what, what do we give up and what do we, uh, you know, how, how do we work as a culture? Like, you're still going to have debates about that. Like, that's, that's like one of the defining uh, things about humanity and history, okay? That, that's never going to go away. Maybe we'll be able to have health care. Maybe we'll be able to go to the doctor. Maybe you're not going to have old people who are cutting up their medication and, 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 and you know, ha having to, like, do without. We could have real discussions. We could look at facts. Um, we 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 could um, actually make informed decisions. And by the way, if we do win this thing within ten years, we're going to have so much of the dark money out of our politics, which is a huge thing. So we could get to the point where all of a sudden we start moving things around. We start re redistributing. That money that was taken from us, the six to seven trillion dollars that have been sucked out of our pockets since the 1980s and given to the wealthiest individuals who are now just showing their ass and showing that they don't deserve that money or trust. Um, you know, all of a sudden we could actually have a functioning middle class. We could actually have a society that isn't being absolutely lorded over by robber barons. Uh, and, and we could start to make even more headway. You start making progress on this thing, it starts accelerating. 20 years is a completely different question. Because at that point, we're talking about what are we doing about climate change? How is that restructuring things? Also, 20 years is a generational shift. A large part of why um, we're in this situation, and I want to point this out, and, and I think this is really important. 
One of the reasons we're in this situation is because that boom generation is getting older and they don't necessarily like what they see coming down the bend and power is about to shift, which always shows us moments of crises when things like this happen. So 20 years from now, I mean, this society would be almost unrecognizable if we win this thing. Could be a whole lot better. By the way, we're moving up to an hour. We have a handful of questions here. We got right at five questions. So we're going to move right up to the hour. I am so thankful that you are here. I hope that this has been a good experience for you so far. We're going to do so much good work for the rest of this year. We are to 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. Cheers to winning the whole damn thing. I think I think the idea of optimism has been poisoned. Um, and, and, and part of the problem, again, is the peddling of false hope. Um, a, a, a part of the problem is that we have a lot of people who are more or less becoming optimistic grifters um, who are trying to tell you, hey, everything's just totally fine. Um, you know, people like me, are fear mongering, um, you know, or whatever. And, and they don't want to sit with the actual thing, which ends up giving hope and optimism a, a bad name. Um, but I do, I, I, I think, I think human beings are really incredible. I think we are very, very special. And I think that we are not wicked. I think that we are not evil. I think that we are not uh, debauched. I think there are a lot of forces that have made us not our best selves, who have made us our worst selves. And I think that we are inching up on starting to unburden ourselves of those things. I think it's, I think we're going to win it. Okay. Next up. Normal isn't good enough anymore. So many people still have their heads in the sand and pretending we're back in 2019. How do, how do we organize and establish community networks which are needed when society is declining when the majority of people are in denial about, well, everything? Well, I, I agree with you that I think the atomization of society is one of the main problems. Normal isn't good enough anymore. Um, I think also we have to approach this in a way that we're not talking about politics, or at least we're not talking about Democrat versus Republican politics. We have to have discussions with people about what is wrong, you know, and, and in particular, what's going on in their lives, what's happening in the individual's life that could be better. And we all know this, you know, uh, everything from like trying to call in to talk to insurance or, uh, you know, getting screwed at work and exploited at work. We all know this, um, you know, and, and you start talking about how, like, why these things are the way that they are. And they are because concentrated capital has captured uh, the energies of government. Period. And when you start having those conversations, you can start talking about how do we make the world better? How do we how do we possibly improve this world? And for some of them, by the way, you want to go back to the idea of optimism. For some people, just improving their lives or improving the world by like 10% is world changing, right? That 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 that's like so so much. Like you don't have to start and basically talk about like a complete fundamental transformation of society. You start finding things to win. I I, I was talking to this group uh like I said last week and I was talking about how a lot of like um major grassroots movements begin with things like getting a a, a bike path built. Because when you have those things, you come together, you start getting wins. It's addictive. It reminds you that if you come together and work together and engage in solidarity, you can have victories, which by the way, is another reason why I'm hopeful. Because look at all of these young people who have no training whatsoever, who are defeating some of the most uh, uh, powerful and wealthy corporations in the history of the world. They're beating Amazon. They're beating Starbucks. They're beating Apple. They are winning. Now, when we talk about this, we're talking about building movements that are going to work and they're going to build solidarity and they're going to build trust. So. 
what I always say is this, start talking about things in their lives, start talking about things that they want, start talking about things that are achievable. And once you start building on that, you're going to engage in trust, solidarity, period. Democracy rebooted. Is there a way to reduce, not counter, the manipulation, fear-mongering, scapegoating, and disinformation from conservative media outlets? There is. And my God, I wish uh, Biden and the Democrats had more fight when it came to this, but it's uh, re-replacing things like the Fairness Doctrine. I mean, you know, use the FCC. Start making this an issue. Start going out in front of people and saying, hey, aren't you tired of how many of your folks are being radicalized by things like Fox News? You can do that. You actually could. I mean, I, I was talking about this, um, man, I can't remember where it was now. But, you know, it's like one of these things where, like, you think about something like Fox News, you're like, man, so many people watch it. Not that many people actually watch it. It just so happens that, like, it feels that way and it's an influential group of people. And if people need to get their news, maybe they turn that on and that's where they, you know, watch the stories. Um, but, like, most people kind of hate Fox News. Most people would much rather that Fox News didn't exist. Most people would rather live in a world where, you know, it wasn't this like strange, like sparkly cable news situation. You can go after these regulations. You can change things, but there has to be some sort of a public call for it. And that's, this goes along with what I keep talking about. There has to be a grassroots movement that pressures the political party in order to carry the things out. And the Democratic Party doesn't feel any pressure right now. None, as a matter of fact. For decades, they have taken for granted their voter base. Since the 1980s, when the Democratic Party went ahead and became Republicanism with a smiling, happy face, uh, they left behind people of color, the poor women, and labor unions. That was the base that they had to always, you know, appeal to. They moved on to the professional managerial class and corporations. They have to feel the pressure to go ahead and start pushing back against these things. But yeah, you can, you can get rid of this. Absolutely you can. It's just people aren't necessarily interested in having those larger, harder conversations because again, they don't want to trouble this massive system that they themselves are benefiting from. So yeah, that's a very doable thing. Toonbox says, looking forward to the book. Thank you. I remember you talking about all the research material you were getting at the library. Not sure if this is too inside baseball, but how do you go about knowing what books to read and where to focus your time? Uh, that's a hell of a question. Uh, one of the things, and I'd recommend for anybody um, if you are interested in learning or doing your own research, you have to start with research questions, which is asking what do, you know, figuring out what you know or what you think you know, and you need to interrogate that because one thing that I learned writing the Midnight Kingdom, American Rule, and all these other books is uh, a lot of the things I thought I knew, I didn't know. But also starting to ask questions. And I will tell you that one of the most important things is that going back to um, going back to the idea of academics, academics have been completely walled off from the rest of the world. And they are doing so much important work that doesn't get beyond the academy's walls. It takes an activist academic, an academic who intentionally goes out and engages with the public in order to get that information out in the world, which is one of the reasons I do what I do is because I come from outside of academia. I come from a working class background. My people like really can benefit from this information. They don't know where to get it. They don't know how to get it. They don't know where to look for it or what to do with it. And I will tell you that moving that information from this, I got a little dog who's barking, moving this information from that class, which is outside of a lot of that struggle and a lot of that strife and moving it uh, to the class who is involved in it. It's very, very important. But the academics, they're out there. Any subject, any time period, any major thing, you can find scholarly work on it. And chances are, and this is something that I found, which was kind of crazy. I would go into these libraries and I would like, I, I, I would open these books up, right? And these books, I, they, some of them, 
The pages were sealed together. They had never been opened, these books, because so much of the academy is about publish things in order to get tenure and promotion and all that stuff in order to jump through hoops. And then they just sort of sit and, you know, um, languish on a shelf. But I, I, I just, you have to go out and you've got to find these sources, find the experts, find all of this stuff. Oh, hearing so many calls about this dog. The dog is very cute, by the way. The dog is very, very sweet, but she is an absolute maniac. I love her, but if she was down here, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to get an ed, uh, a word in edgewise. She's very, very sweet. And as I say usually, if anybody heard me talk to this dog, you wouldn't, you, 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 you wouldn't take me as a serious political analyst anymore. I'm just telling you that. Kansas woman. So now you got a bourbon talk or ADHD asses through your writing and work processes. Like, how are you so productive? Um, I didn't realize, by the way, that I had ADHD. I didn't understand that I was neurodivergent. I didn't understand a lot of things about myself. We'll have discussions about that at a future date. Um, I think, and I used to be really, really bad um, at getting stuff done, keeping things organized. Um, I, for me, the reason I'm able to do what I do and, and I'm able to be prolific is honestly terror. Um, it's trauma. It's the fear that if I don't do it, something bad will happen or, you know, that uh, whatever it's, it's, um, it's, 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 it's a lot of fear and a lot of trauma is how I'm able to like work as hard as I do. Uh, there's a really interesting idea within the, uh, psychotherapy that I do, which is that we have these parts that like make sure that we work hard. And in part it's because of trauma. Uh, but yeah, um, you know, it's, it's guilt that I'm not working in a factory that I'm not like, you know, pulling down some sort of a labor job. Um, and also just fear of what happens if I don't. So that's how I do it. And on that note, by the way, Justin asked, why is Indiana? I don't know. We don't have that much time. I don't know what to tell you. I love Indiana. I love Hoosiers. I love them so much. They're some of the best people on the face of the earth. Man, that state's got problems. I mean, I, I've brought this up in uh, other podcasts and and, and and other conversations, but they are, um, I mean, the, the, the clan, the clan controlled that state for a very, very long time. Um, yeah, Indiana, really, really problematic state, real terrible issues. I mean, I, I, you know, I gotta tell you, I was doing the Midnight Kingdom research and then I found, you know, how much of like the John Birch Society was based in like Indianapolis, Indiana. I was like, yep, tracks. Absolutely. Whew. Um, on that note, by the way, I really, really hope for those of you who have pre-ordered the Midnight Kingdom or the ones of you who are going to pick it up this week, I hope you enjoy it. Um, it is a labor of love, the hardest thing that I've ever done in my entire life. And I will go ahead and say, when I was doing it, my God, was it a lot of work. I uh, It was so many sleepless nights, uh, so many long, long hours. Um, things like uh, the the support on these bourbon talks made so much of a difference. Um, Y'all have always been so kind to me and so supportive of me. And it has just, it's meant everything. So I hope this week uh, that the book finds you well. I hope you enjoy it. I hope it in, I hope it enlightens certain things. Um, I hope it helps you make sense of what this world is, but especially what it could be and what it should be. And um, yeah, I just really, really hope that uh, that you enjoy it. So we'll talk more about that. Uh, I'm going to do some special things with the book release. Um, for my Substack, So if you're not subscribed over there, go do that. Um, I'm looking forward to that. And again, yeah, if, if you do want me to come to your town, if you want me to come, come through, give a book reading, meet with your, uh, meet with your groups, meet with your people, please, 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 you know, reach out to your local bookstore, reach out to your groups. Let's make it happen. I'm, I, all I want in the world this year is to run around, meet some people, work on some things, build some structures. Cause 
this is going to be an absolutely important year. We're going to build the structures that are going to win this thing in the long run. And I can't wait to do that with everybody. All right. Cheers to you, to the support, to the kindness, to the love, and again, to winning the whole damn thing. Cheers. All right. This week, Midnight Kingdom comes out. I'm so sorry you're going to find me everywhere. Looking forward to it. Thanks again, everybody. Bye.